I'd like to introduce Ollie Sylvester Bradley, who I first met. Um, I think Ollie is part of the group of systems actors that we call Control Shift. Um, and Ollie co founded the Open Corp platform and runs an annual two day conference, which the alternative has taken part in a number of times. Um, but Ollie does a, a huge a variety of things. And I think I'm going to hand over to you, Ollie, to, get, to tell us your story. So over to Ollie Sylvester Bradley. Thank you, Indra. Yeah, hi, everybody. Good to be here. Um, so today I want to talk largely about money. I think that one of the elephants in the room in general as regards systems change and trying to create a planet in which people and profit come before, uh, people and planet come before profit is money. Like we are um, all bound by this kind of capitalist system that we have. And that's one of the projects that I've been working on, as Indra said, through the open co-op, largely that sprang out of open 2018, is this idea of mutual credit and how we might be able to transact with each other without using conventional fiat money that is issued as interest bearing debt. Um, so I want to talk about um, economic rebellion to start with, and then just guide you through this uh, site and some of the some of the ideas there, and then come back together and we can have a little poll. I'm interested in to get your perspectives on uh, five questions about money, and then, as Indra said, after that we can talk a little bit about mutual credit and the open credit network, and um, yeah, then I'd be really interested to hear all your ideas and feedback. So. Um, I want to see if I can just share this site, this site that you should see now, economicrebellion.org, um, basically presents the arguments that we think highlight the need for a change in our financial system. Um, so building on the back of the economic, of the Extinction Rebellion kind of uh, movement, this site suggests that we need to deploy the same passion and creativity and decentralized organizing in order to leverage our most powerful tool, that being money. And it's built largely around the ideas of Edwin's, Edward Clarence Regal, who in the 1930s wrote a series of books all about how we could change our financial system. Um, as you see with this quote on the screen, he's really highlighting that money is the most important thing that we could be working on because uh, you know, the reason that I'm bringing this up really is that, you know, I think Extinction Rebellion is great. It's done a phenomenal job. But even though we might uh, decide to support Extinction Rebellion and protest against the, real, the existing system, protest alone is never going to actually solve the problems. Um, because if we all carry on using the conventional money that we have, then we are still locked into the same kind of neoliberalist capitalist system. So this site looks at some of Regal's works um, and it basically says that if money is simply an agreement, then we can simply collaborate to create new agreements. And it puts forward three arguments. I'll leave you to browse this completely at your leisure, but I just want to go over these three different arguments. So the first one is asking you to remember Buckminster Fuller and what Buckminster Fuller told us. And you probably all know this quote, you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this is kind of the, the main kind of um, philosophy, if you like, behind most of my work and most of the Open Co-op's projects. We're trying to deliver systems change and rather than protesting, we're trying to build new systems that make the existing systems obsolete. So it's just trying to call that uh, out basically and say if you actually recognize what Buckminster Fuller taught us all those years ago then one of the most important things to do is to keep that in mind in everything that you do and to think of alternative ways in which we could change the system create new systems in order to make the existing one obsolete so the second argument it puts forwards is to asks you to recognize that the economy is actually the key driver of the economic, of the climate crisis. We can't fix the climate emergency until we fix the economy because money being the root of the problem. Um, and I'll leave you to read all of this again. There's some links to some great articles here, particularly this one by Bill McKibben, the founder of 350.org, um, who highlights this, yeah, money is the oxygen on which the fire of global warming burns. He's basically saying that while we continue to have the existing financial system we do in that 
where money is created as interest bearing debt by central investment banks, um, then we will still have an extractive economy. And it doesn't matter really whether we've set our um, limits to what the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere might be, we're still going to be perpetuating this economic system, which draws from the capital of the earth, has all these hideous externalities, so that while we carry on trading, there's still carbon and other pollutants being pumped into the atmosphere, and that those things aren't really accounted for in our present economic system. Um, the final two parts of this argument are that, yeah, we're more powerful than we think, i.e. we have the ability to create credits, uh, credit between ourselves. We don't have to rely on banks to do this. We can create our own money. As I said before, if money is simply an agreement, then we only need to create new agreements. So the third part of this um, argument is that if you recognize both of those things, that we need to create new systems to make the present system obsolete and that actually that money is the root of all our problems, then the only logical way to react is to build a new economic system. And that's largely what we've been working on under this project, which we call the Open Credit Network. And the Open Credit Network is a mutual credit system, which I'll go on to explain. Um, but I just wanted to highlight here that on this page, like basically what it's, what it's asking you to do is to spread this message, see if other people agree with it, and to collaborate with us and to either start or join an existing credit network of which there are many already around the world. Probably the most two successful examples of which are the Sardex network in Sardinia and the Veer in Switzerland, which has been going for a jolly long time now. And, um, Chris can probably tell us an awful lot about later. Um, so that's, that's the overview of economic rebellion. And that's the sort of starting point for what I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm going to expand on that a little bit more as we go through today's talk on the elephant. Um, but right now, I just wanted to get a sense of people's feelings and understandings about money and wondered if we could run a little poll. But rather than using the Zoom poll, I wondered if we could ask people to just raise hands here so we can get a feel of what people think. Obviously for that to work, we need everybody to boot up their camera if that's possible. Um, see, so we've still got five or six cameras missing, but if we could get the rest, that would be great. If you can't turn on your camera, don't worry. You can give us a plus, plus one or a minus one for no maybe, or even just type yes or a no into, into the chat. That should give us an, a kind of overview. So the first question that I wanted to ask is who here has spent cash today, actual coins or notes? Who has actually spent any cash? One person. That's amazing. One out of 18. And who here has spent some electronic money today? Either by tapping your card or if you know that, um, your mortgage payment or any direct debits or any standing orders have gone out of your bank account. Who's actually spent any digital money? That looks like pretty much everybody. So interestingly, like what I would highlight about that is that we can see that cash is on the way out, right? All transfer or money from now on is basically just digital money. It's just giant ledgers somewhere with transactions going across, things being credited to one account, debited from the other account. But because we're all doing that within the existing neoliberalist capitalist system, every time we do that, every time we tap our card, it's effectively a vote for capitalism, right? Those votes are more important than your votes in the polling box once every four or five years, because we all know whether we get Labour or we get Conservative, None of that is going to change. We're still going to have the same tap, 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 the same economic system and the same money being created as interest bearing debt. No political party has so far, to my mind, put forward an idea which is going to actually change the fundamentals of our economy. And I see this is quite significant, really. Um, so if we think that money is going to turn digital, um, it's interesting to maybe get a bit more of a feel for who has experimented with other forms of digital money. So I wanted to ask uh, next, how many people here have a loyalty card 
for any particular organization, be it a Nectar card or a co-op card or something that gives you points or cashback. Wow, so that's pretty much everybody. Um, <clears throat> and what I would highlight by that is that by doing those transactions, by collecting that form of money, you are already transacting with a new form of digital, uh, digital exchange, if you like. And by doing so, you are actually giving even more power to the corporates, like less, maybe less power to the government because the governments don't run the loyalty schemes. However, by giving your spending information to the companies that um, yeah, issue these cards and collect the points, you're providing them with all of your data, which they then will use to market back to you to try and convince you to sell, to buy more stuff, even whether you need it or not. I went to a great talk once by Mark Thomas, of a stand-up comedian who sat there on stage and he asked the same question. He said, does anybody have a loyalty card? Can you all come and put them in the bucket at the front? And he, he collected everybody's <laughs> loyalty cards. And then he just slowly got the scissors out and he sat there and chopped them all up while he explained to everybody how these things are actually the root cause of all evil and that they're terrible because they are just empowering corporates to market to us more. Um, so I'm not telling you off for having a loyalty card. I mean, everybody can have a loyalty card and sometimes there are economic benefits for doing so. But I wanted to highlight that they are an alternative means of exchange, just another digital currency, in effect, which is controlled normally by a corporate, um, normally venture capital backed entity whose main objective is to pay its shareholders really handsomely. So again, by participating in that system, we're voting for the perpetuation of that system. So my last two questions um, are about different types of digital money. I wanted to ask next, who here has a crypto wallet? And if that doesn't mean anything to you, it's, it's a digital wallet that you have online or on your telephone, which would allow you to transact something like Bitcoin or Ethereum tokens. Does anybody here have a digital, a crypto wallet? So there's one, two, three of us there out of 20, I think. So this is quite informative, like what I'm suggesting really through this talk is that I feel in the future there will be numerous different types of digital currencies and that we will use different types of digital currencies for different types of transactions. Um, so obviously not everybody needs to spend bitcoins, um, but I saw a really amusing advert the other day as I was browsing something about wallets. Um, an advert popped up at the top of my browser advertising uh, an old an old school if you like original leather wallet and it had the most amusing caption on it it said the only wallet that you'll ever need because it comes with like a lifetime guarantee it was a really high spec beautiful sort of man's wallet that they try and market to, to ladies to sell to their husbands and um it just yeah they were trying to they were trying to promote it with this idea that this was the be all and end all of wallets and i just saw the advert burst out laughing because to me the idea of a physical leather wallet is kind of history like the way that i see things moving is towards digital wallets so the idea of only needing a leather wallet seems like an anathema and i feel that yeah like in the future maybe it will be a lot easier to have a digital wallet just in the same way that it's now very easy to switch your banking to using something like Starling or Monzo, where they make transacting online through your telephone extremely easy. And this I see as really one of the next steps for uh, economic transactions is that we need to, if we want to make uh, it possible for people to step outside the kind of current economic system, we need to make it as easy as transacting with all those, um, with, with existing digital cash, if you like, to transact in new ways using alternative currencies. Like at the moment to use a cryptocurrency wallet is pretty complicated. It's not that complicated. It's, you know, you, you have to set it up on your laptop or your, or your phone and you know, understand what you're doing with the different types of currencies that are available. But that hurdle means that a lot of people would just never go there. Um, so my last question I wanted to ask is who here uh, understands what mutual credit is? So that's sort of, what are we saying? Maybe 50-50? So 
that's really useful. Um, and let me know how to pitch this next bit. So I'll probably just talk for about another five or 10 minutes and try and give you a, a quick overview of what it is that we've tried to build and what we are creating with the Open Credit Network. So before I jump in and I'll show you some of the screens there from the website and also the back end so that you can see how you would transact in mutual credit. Um, I just wanted to cover off what I kind of think of money is and what most people define money as, because money is quite a complex term, um, which we normally break down into these three different things. So it has sort of three different functions to money, one being a store of value and that you can go and hide it under your mattress and you've got that there or put the money in the bank. Um, the second being that it's a unit of account. So meaning that I know a pound is worth a pound. If I give Indra a pound, she recognizes that it has that unique amount of value. And if I want to sell a bag of sugar, I can price it in pounds and everybody knows that that's roughly what that means, how much that, that bag of sugar is actually costing. Um, and then thirdly is the means of exchange. So, and that's what we've just been talking about, like transacting in Bitcoins or in, um, even with your vouchers from your loyalty card is just another means of exchange. So it's another way of sending value from one person to another person. Um, so with the mutual credit, credit system that we set up, we didn't attempt to uh, address those first two functions of money, the store of value or the unit of account. What we're trying to do here is change the means of exchange which is quite significant because the most significant aspect of that is that it changes the way that the money is brought into existence. So in a mutual credit system, everybody starts off when they join, everybody starts off with a balance, which is zero and uh, everything is still priced exactly the same in, in pounds. It, this mutual credit system that we've set up is just applicable to uh, businesses in the UK. So it makes it very simple. If somebody wants to sell their web design services for 50 pounds an hour, they will simply charge 50 credits an hour in the mutual credit system. Or if you're selling shoes for 50 pounds, then the pair of shoes is just 50 credits in the mutual credit system. Um, but what it means is that we're not relying on the actual pounds which have been in, invented or created by um, the central or investment banks. So when we start with zero balance, we have an interest-free overdraft effectively, which everybody gets, which we set according to your, um, the state of your business when you set up. But for most businesses, we just default to 500 pounds. This allows you to spend before you earn, which gives a certain amount of liquidity to the system so that people can start transacting and uh, they have this means of exchange, which they can use. And when they do so, they're managing to transact, send goods, send services, and we're not actually using conventional money. So the theory being that if enough people did that, we're taking power away from um, the existing system. And we are effectively ring fencing our own commons, if you like, in that we've built this kind of semi-permeable membrane around our financial commons, that membrane being the membership agreement that you need to sign up to when you join the Open Credit Network. Um, maybe that's a good place to pause, Indra, and just check that at, at least it's clear to you before I go on and, and show a few more things about the website. Yeah, I mean, it sounds, uh, you've, you've given a nice step-by-step um, step into this. I, I really want to see it now. I want to see what you've done. And uh, yeah. okay, let's let's jump straight in then. So uh, yeah. So firstly, I'll just show you show you the site, and um, we'll just we'll dive straight into how it works, as that's probably the most important thing. Um, so here is just a quick step by step. What happens? The first step when you join is that you join the directory. Here we have this lovely example with Bob the Builder. He's joined and he's listing his offers and wants. So his offers being the things that he provides, carpentry, plumbing, electrical works, building and roofing. And he wants to buy building materials, accountancy, food and beer. Um, so when he joins, he gets a, a profile page like this. And then immediately, because the system knows all of these offers and wants from everybody else who's part of the system, the system can highlight 
whether he's got new opportunities for new leads or new suppliers. So when he logs in, his dashboard will just look like this and he can click on building or carpentry to find leads or on beer and food to see who wants to sell to him. So here's his opportunities to uh, start trading. He's obviously, he's now clicked on uh, carpentry here and he sees the, the want from Floor of the Forest, who says, I'm looking for somebody to make shelves for me. So he quickly sends her a message. Hi, Flora, I can make shelves. I've been a builder for 25 years. Send me details of what you need. I'll get cracking straight away. And then Bob notices that Beth is also offering pale ale. So he doesn't have to talk to her about that. He's just like, brilliant. I'm going to go and buy some of that because he's now got this interest-free line of credit, right? He doesn't actually need to even do the job for Flora because he can go and buy the beer straight away. So he initiates a transfer of credits. He sends her 80 to Beth um, for the two crates and off he goes. There's his available credit limit of 500. And then he goes away and um, builds the shelves for Flora. She yeah, is happy with her shelves, so he charges her uh, 350. And what you notice here is that he's initiating both of these transactions from Bob's perspective. So here he's sending money, which you might imagine is quite obvious, but here he's actually sending an invoice effectively by clicking, I want to receive. He's actually saying, please pay me this. This is effectively like sending an invoice. So now you can see that his current balance is minus 80 because he's already bought the beer. Um, and then she, uh, Flora, approves his transaction. So 350 units come in and he has this overall balance here. And you can see his list of transaction history. That is effectively it. Um, there's a little video here which explains it and there's um, some, a few more examples that you can go through as well. Um, but now I just wanted to jump in to the actual system here and show you. So this is now the live system. I just logged in. Um, this is my business name, de facto design, and you'll see my balance up here. Um, so there are these, these leads for me here. Um, and I've put my, my wants as food, you can see. So there's several tags that people have created for food. If we just have a look here, we'll now see the list of uh, people that I could trade with. That's interesting because this one is actually new and I didn't know this was here. Um, so let's have a look what Kent Food Hubs are offering. They're a trading member, which means they've signed up and they're ready to trade and they are offering food and craft products, training and education. So the website doesn't go to the full length of actually trying to list every single product of every different supplier because otherwise it would kind of be trying to come become Amazon. All it's trying to do is to say, you know, this is a means by which you can contact this business. So um, I can send them a message here saying, can we do a trade? But obviously in order for me to figure out if they've got something that I really want, I have to look what they've got and um, figure out, yeah, which things I might want to buy from them and then go back and send them a message and say, can I buy this? And if they say yes, then I can initiate a trade here, just like we saw. I want to send 34 credits to them for lots of kale. Um, so mm -hmm. th this is the basic system. Um, and obviously you could start to, uh, yeah, do more and more of your business in here, um, thereby moving your transactions outside of the extractive economy and into the regenerative economy because all of the people that have signed up here are pretty much all um, people who have are offering variously ethical services. They're all kind of, you know, community and um, social enterprise orientated businesses or co-ops. Um, there is another way to browse the directory here. If you just, if you think that you want, I don't know, uh, marketing or motoring, um, you can browse this way. Um, so this guy's obviously offering uh, driving lessons. Um, let's have a look what else we have here. Hmm. Another driving instructor, that was interesting. Um, somebody offering social media. Lots of people are happy to develop uh, software for you in mutual credit, even security systems. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the private eye is offering. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, hmm. I see, not really a private eye by the looks of this, mainly a permaculture person. Um, but I think you get the idea. Like basically this is a, uh, a system in which you can find, find things that you might need, offer things um, to other people to sort of supply their wants. And it provides you with an easy way to contact them. When you send them a message through here, it simply kicks out an email straight to them from you. And after that, we're not trying to lock you into the platform in any way. Um, this email then arrives in their inbox as if it came for you so they can reply directly and unlike Airbnb or something which tries to keep you in the system and X is out anytime you put a phone number in. Like we don't really mind if that happens because we're hoping that you'll be really happy that you found a new supplier or a new business through the Open Credit Network and hopefully you'll come back and trade in the system as well by clicking this button here. Um, but we don't really, um, we don't really mind if you then just go and transact with them using conventional money, like hopefully the fact that you build up a trading relationship with them will then encourage you to come back and start trading in, in mutual credit. So that's the quick overview. Um, the other things that are important to mention about the Open Credit Network is that it is organized as a co-op. And this kind of ties us neatly back to where Indra introduced uh, myself and, and what we're doing with the Open Co-op. Basically, since we've been going since 2004, and we've been promoting the idea that um, the future is all about co-ops, and the more co-ops that we can initiate, the better. But unlike traditional co-ops, which might be local to you and very small, and um, yeah, kind of in a way, I think co-ops have a quite a stuffy old school image and bring, to bring forth ideas about lots of people sitting around in meetings and not getting a terrible amount done. Um, on the contrary, we like to promote the idea of platform co-ops, which are decentralized online co-ops of which anybody can become a member and normally split their membership into various different classes. So at the Open Credit Network, um, we have the same philosophy in which there's a sort of class of member, which is the people that run the platform. And then there are the the traders, so they're all members of the co-op and have a say in how it's run. And then there would be suppliers as well, people who provide the software or any other services for the co-op. They also get a say in the governance as well as potentially any investors. Um, so it's a system within which, yeah, you as a member can have some degree of control over the governance. And the other unique factor um, of the Open Credit Network is that as far as we know, we are the only uh, established mutual credit network which is using completely open source software, um, which was explained. Um, I'll just share that for, for the, the geeks amongst you. Um, so as was highlighted in the Economic Rebellion uh, site, we talk about the fact that we want to do this using open source software. And this will link you directly here to our GitHub account where anybody uh, is free to download this software, which we call MCCS, the Mutual Credit Communication System. Um, so there is, there's the whole repo of software. If you wanted to go and set up a software uh, system exactly like the one that I just demonstrated to you, you can simply download this, install it on your server, and go and create your own local mutual credit system in your own community or country um, anywhere around the world. So we've had numerous inquiries about that. And um, at the moment, the state of the open co of the open credit network, as you saw, is that there are people in there and there's, there's a lot of uh, things on offer, but we need to hit a critical mass. This is obviously one of the main uh, issues with establishing any form of mutual credit is that it only really works or it works better <clears throat> the more people that you have at the moment you can take your pounds or your um, your credit card and go and tap anywhere and buy anything in any country around the world and you don't have to worry about whether those people accept that currency because <clears throat> our general fiat money is is so ubiquitous um, whereas you might find that the things that you want to buy within the open credit network aren't currently available. So we're kind of at the moment in really the membership onboarding phase, and we're hoping to bring on somewhere around 350 active trading businesses before we move to the next stage and invite individuals, i.e. people who aren't a sole trader or a registered limited company of some description, because without those existing businesses, 
you would kind of end up with a traditional sort of let system in which you know it's quite hard to transact because there aren't the range of things from throughout the supply chain that you might want to buy so it makes it quite hard for to have a sort of a comprehensive economy so that's our strategy is to try and bring on at least 350 active trading businesses which we've kind of heard from others is the sort of magic number at which this might take off um, and after that point yeah we'll be opening it up to individuals to be able to trade as well although unless they can prove they have some way of um, earning credits as well as spending credits then they probably won't get as much of a credit line as any incorporated business would um, so that's probably enough from me um, I'll pass yeah, you back great. to Indra. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ollie. And um, it's great to hear you talk through it because I sort of had a visceral feeling of it, you know, that I haven't had before. And that was really very helpful. Um, and we've got some good questions already in the chat box. But let me just ask you one thing that, that sort of that, that I need to understand, which yeah. what is the geographical aspect of this? Because if if um, you know, if I'm offering to put up some shelves, obviously, I can't be living in a very different town from you or you know, and so, so can you describe how that's uh, arising within your current network, the sort of ge geographical part of it? But also yeah. maybe could you also point at, because I know that I've been in your events and um, th that uh, there are people experimenting with this all over the world, actually. Um, and so is there a, yeah, is there a global aspect as well? So all the geography, anything you can add to that, I'd be really... Yeah, in yeah. a great question. It's it's a really complicated subject and we've had numerous debates about this at the Open Credit Network as to whether we should be starting on one locale. Like, should we just be doing this for London so that then, you know, if I'm advertising shelves, for example, everybody knows that they can buy them? Or should we be trying to go nationwide? Um, so the objective is to hit this scale uh, point as fast as possible, which is why we've actually selected to go UK wide to start with, because a lot of the products and services on there are things which people would post if they're products, like they don't mind sending them the length or breadth of the country. And a lot of the other things are digital services, which doesn't matter where you are, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Like the example of shelves is not particularly useful if that person's in Edinburgh and you're in London. So as part of the system, we've highlighted, um, your, the cities, so you can even see in the overview page where all of the listings were, where everybody is. And one of the next features that we wanted to implement was this idea of local clubs, so that basically you might join your sort of Manchester club, which is part of the larger network. Um, and so if you were to search, for example, for eggs, you know, it wouldn't bring up um, anybody who is outside your local area because nobody's gonna post you eggs. Um, so, and that would require us to be able to do some quite sophisticated things in terms of knowing your proximity. So then we could do proximity searches basically so that it could say in those listings, this person is X miles from you, this person is a little bit further and list them in terms of distance from you, which I think, you know, it is an obvious next step. It would have been an, a, another step of software development, which is why we didn't do it from the outset. Um, but, it's definitely a key thing because we want to enable local economies. That's that's one of the key drivers. But in order to first try and achieve the economies of scale and actually bring on the right number of people, we selected to go nationwide. Um, so yeah, there are people from all over the UK. Then we've sort of taken that inspiration from uh, Sardinia, where they have the Sardex network, which is Sardinia wide. So the Sardex network now has various other affiliated schemes which are in regions of Italy um, and so they work on a regional basis and you can do an inter-regional trade so you could train from the Bologna area with somebody in Sardinia if you, they had particular wine or olives that you wanted um, but that just requires the money to sort of take an extra jump and having been out there and spoken to Giuseppe one of the founders of, of Sardex he was very quick to point out that actually Although people see this as the holy grail, like being able to transact in mutual credit outside of an existing network and outside of an existing locale, actually it's not, it's always a very small part of any um, 
any mutual credit system because people prefer to trade locally and actually going to the lengths of, of shipping stuff and making the extra jump between mutual credit systems is complicated and involves additional risk, basically. Um, the risk of the goods not arriving or the risk of something going wrong with the transaction on the steps. So primarily we want to try and yeah, start at the national level and then once we get more members, it will be obvious to try and cluster them together. You can imagine having a kind of Birmingham or Manchester network when you hit a, mm. key, a key amount of people in those mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Thanks very much. So I'm, I'm just going to go through the, um, the questions that are already in the chat box, but I'll, I'll inv I'm going to invite you to ask your own question. So Steve, uh, would you like to start? You're the first question in the box. Yes, it all seems to me um, with these uh, schemes that it, the government, once they, it's fine if they're small and marginal. And then once they get to a certain scale, the government's going to step in and say, uh, what about taxes? <laughs> So yeah. I'm wondering how you're anticipating handling that. So we're very clear, and there's an article on the site which talks about tax. Um, we say, yeah, you have to pay your tax just like normal. So and we've spoken to an accountant. The article on the site is actually written by an accountant um, who does people's accounts who use both mutual credit and conventional uh, invoices. And he basically says it's just the same as if you were taking money on PayPal. Um, it's just another line in your accounting system and you should pay tax on it. Like we don't really want to get involved in those debates. So we just say, please pay your tax. Um, I guess in theory, if somebody wanted to hide their transactions, they could, but at some point, as you say, um, if it got really big and effective, then the government might come and knock on our door and say, can you disclose uh, all of the transactions, please, so that we can track anybody down who's not been paying their tax, at which point we would, we would have to do so and we'd have no problem doing so. Um, but apart from the tax question, I don't personally think that there is any law against doing what we're doing. We haven't actually invented a currency. All we're doing is holding a ledger of balances. Um, and Chris Cook can probably fill us in on some of the background of this, but personally, I don't think there's any law against us having a, a ledger of positive and negative balances, especially if they are not called a currency. Um, so that's where, yeah, we're quite careful with the way that we word things. And we certainly say that we're not um, giving you an overdraft, for example. We're not issuing loans, because if we were issuing loans, we would get caught by the Consumer Credit Act and we'd have to jump through loads of uh, legal hoops. So hence the, the term credits. I um, hope that answers your question, Steve. Um, well, I think that it, uh, it does for the interim. I would just say that in the longer term, one of the government's major powers is the issuance of money and credit. And that's what central banks are established for. They're very powerful organizations. So I think there is a battle coming up that needs a strategy. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, completely hear you. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is take money away, uh, take power away from, from the, the government by uh, creating our own means of exchange and take power away from, from the central banks. Yeah, you can imagine that they would be very undermined if, if the majority of people started to transact in this way. But I think it would be very difficult for them to stop us because just like we can go to the pub and I can buy you a bunch of pints and we can buy everybody here, but once we can, we can keep a balance as to, you know, whose round is it next? Like I might end up owing somebody a pint or having one extra pint, but that is effectively what we're doing here. We're, we're working to our mutual interest um, just by clubbing together. And there's certainly no laws about stopping you, stopping you clubbing together to, to, share, to share the things that you want. So I think it's, it's a, gonna be an, an interesting battle when it arrives. And to my mind, it will come down to how you describe what you're doing. If you say, we've created a new currency and we're issuing loans, sure, they're gonna come down on you like a ton of bricks and it would be very easy for them. But if you just say, we're a private club and we're, we're keeping uh, some sort of tally of, of favors and records between each other, then I think they would, they would struggle to find a way to close you down. Can we move to, yeah. Um, 
that's great actually thank you um brian connolly you've got a question there a uh, so uh, I currently work in Scottish Enterprise in the field of community wealth building, um, and certainly a kind of a, an idea that's um, growing in momentum at the moment. Um, and one of the key pillars uh, with regards to that again is investment, looking at ways to kind of I suppose retain wealth within specific geographies and ultimately ensure that again money is held by the community because we recognise the multiplier benefits that come from this. It's been really interesting listening um, to this presentation just in terms of, again, as I say, the possibilities. Certainly one of the other areas we're exploring at the moment is the concept of a community bank as well and trying to, again, kind of look at ways to keep wealth very much rooted in place. Um, I've noted a number of companies, perhaps over the last few years, have also looked to introduce their own currency um, in the form of like, you know, gift vouchers within a town that are universally recognised, but ultimately it brings people back and helps them kind of keep that finance flowing to the benefit of uh, local residents. So I suppose um, it was more trying to kind of understand from a community wealth building perspective what you think some of the opportunities are uh, for something um, like mutual fund or mutual, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 tied directly to that community wealth building objective because yes, you're trying to keep money within the social enterprises and and the businesses which would uh, be part of the network. So, as in the answer to Indra about the locales, you know, if your area was to have its own um, kind of club, you know, which is a small network within the larger network, then it'd be very easy for people to see in the listings, these are all the other businesses, these should be your kind of preferred suppliers. If you want to keep the money within your local economy, these are the people you should be trading with. Um, but then if you were to kind of turn that off, turn off that local filter, you would see the range of companies from the rest of the UK. And I think that transacting in with those companies would still be preferable to sort of just Googling new supplier because you know that the people there have aligned values with you. So even if your money was moving from Scotland, maybe out to the north, then you know, you're still supporting the social enterprise or community wealth building economy. Um, I like the vouchers idea. I think you're right, that certainly has uh, value and I know Dan from uh, Good Money down in uh, Brighton who runs a very similar system sort of using Brighton based vouchers. Um, they started off wanting to build a mutual credit system and fell back to the idea of vouchers partly because it was easier to implement. Yeah. Uh, that said, I'm not such a fan of vouchers as I am of mutual credit because they still don't do the fundamental thing that we're trying to do here, which is to change the way that credit is created. If you want to buy a voucher, you still have to take your Fiat Fiverr and go and buy that voucher in the shop. So we're still creating credit in the same way. Um, so it doesn't actually change the fundamental way that money is is created and so that I see as a slight drawback but obviously there are there are benefits of keeping the money in the local economy the other aspect of that that I would highlight is that you talked about community wealth building and investment and one of the things that mutual credit really doesn't do certainly in the form and the guise that I've presented here is it doesn't work for investment so you couldn't really uh, build a new building or a new office or you know create any infrastructure by financing it with mutual credit that's not what it's designed for it's designed really for those transactional relationships where you might have a repeat business with uh, various numbers of suppliers and customers but the way that we figured it so this is coming back to those three different aspects of money the store of value the unit of account and the means of exchange we've tried to address the means of exchange and we think very easily if we got enough people using the network we could move to a different unit of account right we could ask people to price things in a different way if suddenly the uk was to fall into a recession for some reason god knows why that might be then we could say okay let's switch to using a basket of indicators so now everything should be priced in you know whatever it is you know the average of a price of a pint of milk and a loaf of bread and a pack of cheese. So that if we had runaway inflation, your currency wouldn't disappear down the same hellhole as the pound. But then the third aspect is this store of value. And 
that is obviously what's required for investment. If you wanted to invest in some infrastructure for your wealth building in your local economy, you would need um, some different mechanism. Um, the way that we figure it is that if the mutual credit networks were to succeed, i.e. we are to have thousands, tens of thousands, hopefully hundreds of thousands of businesses signed up and transacting, then it would be extremely easy off the back of that to launch some sort of new investment currency, um, which would work in a different way, wouldn't be mutual credit, but would give communities the power to pool their resources and do community wealth building in an entirely new way. So that's quite a long-winded answer, but I hope it, I hope it gets uh, helps. Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take a couple more questions, but I do think after that we should go into our breakout rooms and uh, we can ask more questions of uh, Ollie at the end. Ollie, I don't know if you'll be running away at 6.30 or whether or not you have a bit of leeway. Oh, I know you have a son. Uh, there's a bit of leeway, yeah, but yeah, we'll see if the <laughs> screaming kicks in. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Herbert, would you like to ask your question? Are you there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, mine is much as the same as Steve. Hi. Um, you know, Amazon is a, a wicked person because they come and trade in this country and don't contribute to building hospitals, roads and all the rest of it. If your system gets up off the ground, what we're talking about, why would that be any different? Why would you be able to opt out of potentially give, making the same contribution to those uh, community assets? Uh, in terms of not paying tax? Yeah. Well, the Open Credit Network would have to pay tax as a UK business, just in the same way as any other business, unlike a big supranational, if you want to call them that, like Amazon. You know, we wouldn't be looking to do offshore accounting. And I think because our membership governed the organisation, um, I just don't see that as a possibility. Like there is no way that our stakeholders would allow us to open up a bank account for any funds, um, you know, in a tax haven. Like the, basically the idea is that the members control the organization. So there are fees, which we've, we've not mentioned. Like at the moment, all fees are waived, but once we hit a certain point and the transactions kick in, there would be a small fee to be part of the network. And then there would be a tiny transaction fee, which gets charged in mutual credit. But the members would be invited to set those fees. So obviously there are some costs to running the servers and the things that you've seen and actually for having people help with the transactions just like any organization. So the objective is for the business to cover those costs. It has no objective to make profits at all. And because the members would be able to set the fees, the idea is that they would set them at a level which hopefully would be able to pay everyone a decent living wage um, but there wouldn't be any other profits unless, of course, people decided to vote that we should be supporting schools or other essential infrastructure in the UK, which you can imagine being the case, right? If, if everybody who signed up to the membership agreement, which is quite ethical, um, you know, it kind of, yeah, excludes you if you're a, a hideous capitalist. So we kind of imagine that the people <laughs> who join might be interested in, in voting for those things, in which case they might decide to spawn a community wealth building fund using some of the transaction profits from everybody's transactions. Um, so yeah, the answer to that is really, it will be up to the members. Thank you. Thank you, Oli. Stephanie, are you still here? Yeah, I am. Because I think you've got a couple of questions. I don't know, I don't mind which, what, which should just uh, which you want to or ask both if you like and then we'll go into I'll, break up rooms thank yeah. you i'll go for the, the second if that's okay indra um stacco who oliver must know from the disco yeah talks of the privilege of activism and the need for livelihood bread money with the cat system that recognition that we need to be able to afford to to be active in activism um so i'm just questioning the, the traditions in wales for example with the miners welfare are very similar to some of this ethos but there's a almost like a credibility gap and it's how how can you embrace this becoming radically inclusive and culturally democratic so that it's not seen as something for a privileged few but it's seen as something that can transform communities for example communities in the valleys where there's a culture of mutual aid and this might actually be a really powerful way forward so it's just a question to Oliver, not meant to be controversial, just curious. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. I'm not quite sure if there's a question in there, but the, I guess what I would say is like, yeah, we love the work of Stacco and the, and the disco model, which is for everybody else is, is the di idea of a distributed co-op, which is basically kind of what I was describing earlier, a co-op which is owned by many people from all over the world or, or from different communities. Um, I think definitely it supports the idea of, of mutual aid. Um, and as we've seen in the, you know, during COVID, there's been a whole heap of mutual aid networks that have, have sprung up. And we're very interested in talking to them about how they might transition into using mutual credit to, to yeah, facilitate transactions in local economies. Um, okay, I'll just, I'll just put down then, there are places like Project Skyline with Chris Blake in the valleys that are working on land justice with communities who are valleys communities. Many people have been out of work for generations. Um, and it's challenging that idea that land access commoning is something of a privilege or middle-class occupation or whatever. And it just might be really interesting to put you into contact with people like Chris um, who are generating this work as parts of deep democracy stuff that they're doing, the sustainable places. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. I'd, I'd love that. that. That sounds brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. And okay. I guess what I would say, you know, at the moment, I think this is, it is partly exclusive because for it to work, you have to have really good online access. Well, pretty much everybody in the UK can get good online access these days because you can get on the internet in your public library when they open again. Um, but also the majority of people have smartphones. Okay. Some people don't. So maybe it does exclude them to some extent. But there's also the sort of understanding and the technical barrier to actually, you know, as I mentioned with the crypto wallet, it's like setting up your account and, and knowing what you have to do. And I think that the onus falls on us there in terms of trying to make this easy. Like we're very aware of the fact that this is never going to become ubiquitous unless it is so easy and so understandable that it's the same as just sending money via PayPal. Like I think that's cut across all the divides now. Everybody knows how to send money on PayPal. And we need to make this as simple for it to work. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. That, that's exactly the feeling that I, I have with it. But, uh, you, you know, when I, when I think about the, can, the Citizens Action Networks that, that are springing up around the country, I'm thinking this is the perfect, um, you know, way for them to, to, to accelerate, actually, to get more and more right. um, feeling amongst them. Of, and building relation it's a means of building relationship and exactly yeah, because you knowing know, each other better there's something about actually transacting with people which breaks down barriers as well you know mm. i've kind of read some very interesting stuff about how you know uh transactions you know trade actually helped reduce war in in back in history you know people used to come together and fight but then they realized you have axes and we have horses or something and they started transacting and that led to, you know, better civilizations, better relationships, long-term relationships building up and trading mm -hmm. builds trust. I think those two things go hand in hand. And certainly, yeah, in the Citizens Action Networks, you know, they're coming together and they have these relationships, but then to actually be part of a transacting trading relationship strengthens those bonds in a way that it's different. It's, you know, it takes it kind of to another level. And if you can do that in a way which you know is mutually beneficial and sits outside of the existing politics, then yeah. you are really, you're kind of in this quite special club. And that, that is the kind of exactly the feeling that we're trying to shoot for here, because we're hoping that that will be the thing that makes people feel proud and want to share the idea and help it grow. I think without that, it, it may not work. Mm. Um, and just one more thing on the, mm. on the, um, the, the idea um, that Stephanie was mentioning. Um, we know that in Sardinia, like the reason that this worked and they have four or 5,000 businesses now trading something like 50 to 60 million euros within their network per annum. Wow. But we know the reason that it worked is because they had a hideous financial crisis in 2008. I mean, it was so bad in Sardinia that people were committing suicide because they had no money. They had no means of transacting. The euro bombed. There were just no euros available. So there were farmers and producers and manufacturers sitting there. They still had their buildings. They still had their machinery. They still had electricity, but they couldn't get access to credit. 
So they couldn't buy the things that they needed in order to start producing. So they couldn't sell anything, so they couldn't make any money. So people were really, really desperate. And that's when Sardex set up and kind of why it kicked off. And we're very aware of the fact that actually in the UK, we thought, oh, brilliant, you know, this is a ripe, the time is ripe for this. However, you know, we haven't had thousands and hundreds of thousands of people register. And I take that largely because actually in the UK, we're extremely wealthy. Although it is quite hard to get a small business loan, people have quite a lot of money. We don't have that same level of financial hardship. Like I'm talking, you know, real difficulty within the economy, which I think may be one of the necessary drivers to make this become ubiquitous, unless we can achieve what we were just discussing, Indra, like that, that idea within, um, yeah, kind of mutual mutual aid groups and, and local community groups where they want to move to using something like this to strengthen their own little economies because of, basically because of ethical reasons. Without yeah. that, you know, you need a financial driver, I think, to make it work. Yeah. So, um to to strengthen the um, relationships in this group, <laughs> we're going to go into breakout rooms. Um, and Oli, I think you'd like to set a question. Um, it's we've 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 gone over. Our, we're out of our usual schedule, so I think it'll just be quite a short breakout room, ten minutes or so. But why don't why not um, set a question that uh, every kind of person might might want to? Yes. Yeah, so I was thinking of asking people. Um, what would it take for you to join or want to transact within a mutual credit network like the Open Credit Network? Um, or what would stop you? It could be an alternative way of asking it. Um, I'd be very interested to, to, yeah, to try and understand, especially from people who run uh, their own business or, or are part of a business, um, yeah, what they think, what they, would, what they would want to see in order to join, um, and what might stop them joining. Fantastic. So uh, we'll move to breakout groups now. Just quickly introduce yourselves and then, uh, yeah, try to answer Ollie's question. We'll be back here in 10 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, I imagine that the, the one thing that um, Ollie would like to hear is responses to his question. So I'm going to invite everybody to, to, to contribute. And then if we've got time left at the end, um, we, we, we can reopen it for, for a few questions and see how we go. But uh, would anybody like, if, you, if I think the way to do it now is if you could put up your hand um, and um, if, you've got a, if you've got an answer for Ollie. Um, Pat, why, not, why don't you start? You're muted, you're muted. Hi, uh, yes, thanks, Pablo. Jump in if I get any of this wrong, but in terms of things that would motivate you to use a mutual credit network, um, Pablo's working in I think it's uh, the Canary Islands trying to bring in something exactly the same, a complementary currency. Mm -hmm. But you know, something like the kids, something like um, uh, and Sardinia is an island, right? So, the, so the idea of being an island, the idea of being a tourist economy in this circumstance is challenging because of air flight coming down and COVID and so forth. So the idea of uh, the, the posh word is endogenous economic activity in, in, a, in an area. That would be that would be the encouragement is that you think you've got an infrastructure to keep value local, but in the face of short, medium, long term economic challenges. Have I got that right, Pablo? Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, so so it's a project of the Canary Islands, uh, Communify, and uh, what we find is that uh, it's very difficult to uh, to. Uh, to get to people if you don't, well, you, you need to start and achieve a certain result. So now we're trying to have uh, pilot projects in certain uh, municipalities. So uh, to, to have the backing there of also of, uh, the, of, uh, of the authorities so that, uh, so you can reach the, uh, the, local, the local business and it somehow it's not something that you do uh, on an, on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis, but at least you can reach a certain uh, criti critical mass, so that others, uh, you know, like uh, can, can see that it uh, that you're creating somehow an ecosystem where you can have a circuit, and this mutual credit uh, that they, they can find 
uh, the partners for their own uh, for, for their business. Uh, I think uh, if if uh, each uh, each business is uh, sees itself like an island, so with, with nobody to uh, to uh, deal with, I think it's very difficult. Uh, with Sardex, for example, it was through the knowledge of the whole uh, uh, community of business and people didn't know each other before or maybe having other uh, uh, relationships with, uh, with uh, mainland uh, Italy when they maybe had a supplier a uh, hundred uh, meters from um, and away. So, so the fact that you do connect with, uh, with, a lo with local business and you know Everybody, I think, is what uh, what would be the, the key to uh, to make people believe that it's possible. Oli, anything to say back to that? <clears throat> no, I agree wholeheartedly, and I think that the strategy of um, working with municipalities is is bang on. Like it's something that we're hoping to do more of here. So we're in conversations with uh, the council in Preston who we know quite well because of the Preston model and we heard earlier about the community wealth building aspect. I think any sort of local authorities that are working on community wealth building will kind of get this and then like you said if they endorse it then it becomes a much more easier kind of sell you know you're not kind of knocking on doors saying I want to introduce this weird new economic idea if it's coming from the local authority then yeah it should be much easier to make it work so I think that sounds great. Can I ask a question there? And tell me, I, I might be very naive here, but where where is it? Does it isn't a municipality a crossover between something that is genuinely independent and something that is actually still in the vertical system in some way? How do you mean? Would it would it still remain independent as a as a currency if it was being endorsed by the? Oh, I see. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, much in the same way as like Bristol decided to accept Bristol pounds for council tax. Like, you know, we'd love that to happen because then it would, you know, make it much easier um, to, you know, encourage people because there'd be something that everybody could could spend on. Um, but in Preston, I mean, they've already built up a network of local businesses that the council procure from, and they're looking to do more of the same. So they want to set up like a web development co-op and various others of these local businesses for exactly the same reason we heard earlier about keeping the money in the local economy. Um, and so if they're doing that already and they're trying to spend money locally, there's no reason why the council shouldn't do that in mutual credit if they can collect uh, council tax and then spend their money back, they become a major player in their local economy. But, but are they not in hock somewhat to the party political system? I don't think they are necessarily. I mean, especially if we look, it depends, obviously, yeah, which which form of council you've got. You know, if you think about Froome, it would be, be fantastic. And I think Preston, yeah, are quite, quite separate. Obviously, yeah, some local authorities I'd see as, yeah, they are quite in bed with the existing politics, but others are different. So yeah, we might have to be careful about which municipalities we work I, with. I, I think you'd have to be careful because if you if you were in bed with one for two or three years, it could still be taken over by another. And then what would happen to your system if you right. were dependent upon the council to guarantee it in some way? Anyway, it's yeah, not I think a, yeah. That's a, it's a key it's a key point. Yeah, I mean, I guess we would never look for them to underwrite anything. So there would still be the opportunity to exclude them at any moment. Like basically the members determine who's allowed in and who gets kicked out. So if at some point yeah, there was a problem, I can anticipate like it being possible to kick the council out. But yeah, you're right. It, if they'd become a kind of what we call an anchor institution, i.e. they're an essential sort of big player in this local mm. economy, that could be problematic. Yeah, you need the can. You need the can to guarantee it. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, is anybody else uh, from a group? Farida, I think you were in a group. Would you like to, yeah, would you like to feedback? Well, I started off, hello, hello everyone, um, by saying that, I, of course, I am interested in the subject. And I believe more than money is the problem, not just money, but attitude toward money. And because people have emotions about money, sort of finding ways to transform energetically how you feel about it would be very fascinating. 
And then for me, I think it would be more of a delay because just with everything that's happened, the school that I've had for 40 years is I'm taking a lot of time and energy transforming it into a virtual school. And so adding in something at the time to think about how I would work with that would be more of a delay rather than a, than a no, I think I would be interested. And I have lived in communities before where we have worked on exchanges. And in British Columbia, because I was around Indians a lot with the history, and they're also in my family, their culture was the more you give, the more wealthy you are. Because giving shows <laughs> that you have abundance and that you understand the more you give and it begins to make things move. And, and so I have all of that energy. So we had a great talk. <laughs> And I enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's great. I think that there's a, there's a key part of it there that you said is the sort of attitude to money, like the, the psychology of our existing capitalist economy, you know, which, which works on this idea of scarcity and competition is so pervasive. Like it's just everywhere that actually, even when we've tried to explain mutual credit to quite intelligent CFOs or CEOs of some organizations, they're so trapped in that thinking that no, hang on, we need money. I can't do this without money. And it's an overwhelm and their brains are locked. I mean, they're exactly locked and fear because mm. in that world, the more they have, the more they fear as opposed to the, you know, the British Columbian Indians. My nephew actually broke the whole tradition of having the potlatch broken for 300 years, traveled around the world and spent unbelievable amounts of money collecting blankets and baskets and jewelry. And they had a big potlatch for the first time in 300 years. And it really transformed a lot of the negativity in the nat native community in British Columbia. The fact that that could be overcome and that people could begin giving again. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree. I think this is, what we're, we, we in our group, we spoke about trust, and I think building up the element of trust is intrinsic to mutual credit, but it also, mutual credit helps build up trust. And then once there is additional trust in our society, then maybe we can move away from even needing systems of ledgers in order to record our transactions and move towards a more cooperative economy. That would be great. And then the other thing was, I have lots to give to, you know, because I couldn't give education, consulting, treatments or whatever. But because my whole process now is, be, is to need less, have less, discover how to live incredibly simply. And the fact that I've stopped growling at Google and hating the internet. <laughs> And then I'm learning all these programs and I'm going to be podcasting. I mean, I can hardly believe what's happening to my brain. But I, I had such an emotional relationship with the internet that took me such a huge amount of money. I really do have compassion for people about money. <laughs> because there's so much, you know, of that, that is a part of it that we have to face in our transformation. Yeah, it's a huge transition that we have to go through. And I think, yeah, th those things you've mentioned are key. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Steph, I think you had, um, I, and I can see that you're waiting to ask something. Did, can, I just want to ask permission from everyone that we could perhaps go over for five, five minutes, because I think that's where it's going to happen, if you'd like to. Are you happy with that, Ollie? I don't want to pressure you. Okay. Um, Steph, you want to have something to ask? can't hear you though. Sorry, I had my microphone on. <laughs> okay. uh, Oliver, have you ever tried presenting in the form of a game? Because what, what, what we've noticed is if you present um, an alternative monetary system to people in a, a classical presentation style, you, you get a lot of cognitive resistance. What we did is we, we, we created a game, so we, we use it in a workshop and we let people just experience the current monetary system, then the alternative monetary system. And then after, afterwards, once they've, they've played the game twice, the first question we always ask is, what did you feel? And the discussions we have after people have played the game are tremendously different from the discussions we have when we mm. give the presentation. That's right. 
No, I've I've heard about this, and I mean, I'm aware of some of your work at Happy Money, Steph. So, um, yeah, I'd love to find out more about that. I mean, we've toyed with doing that at some of the conferences, mm -hmm. and we've, you know, I've discussed with Matthew Slater. Like, he has a little game whereby, yeah, you issue everybody with some just paper tokens, and then you yeah. have this paper game. And we even had Francesca Pick, who in uh, Open 2018, yeah, played a money game with people yeah. in order to do exactly what you're saying, like break down their perspectives and relationships with money in order to overcome those hurdles. But I'm slightly wary. I mean, you know, your experience is obviously great than mine here. So I'm interested in what you have to say. And there's probably things we can learn here. But I'm slightly worried that playing it as a game somehow undermines the, uh, the real tangible notion of this like you know we're trying to say this isn't a game money is deadly serious and the more that you transact in the existing economy you know the worse that is and if you use this but this is very serious this is a serious you, alternative you could, to money you could turn it around and you just say like the money we use now is also a game because what people are trying to do is all everyone's trying to get a high score on their on their accounts <laughs> so if you turn that way you say like it's already a game Let's just change the game. And it's Instead human. of trying to make the new system dead serious, there's mm. shift the perspectives on, on the current system that is not, not that serious at all. It's, it's just numbers in computers in the end. That one I really struggle with because if I say that to people who are struggling to pay their mortgage, they're going to be like, you know, this isn't a game, man. I'm about to get evicted, um, you know, or whatever. I can't pay my rent. My kids are going to starve. This isn't a game. Like, you're being flippant with something that is very fundamental to my well-being and my family's yeah. well-being. Like, I this is why I worry about it. I mean, I completely agree. You know, to me, it is we've invented this emperor's new clothes, right? Yeah. This whole pyramid Thing that we've built is just pure insanity it's it's the insane game and we're all off you know playing away blinkered like lemmings running towards the edge of the yeah. cliff but just saying that doesn't take away the serious nature of our scarcity economy for most people what, what, i think uh, what, what should, we, I should we do both though i mean surely yeah. there's a mixture we find that in the work we do with the cans that most of the time if there's a, a lack of trust we're trying to do what Farida was talking about, which is to build good emotion, relationship, value, this sense of warmth, <laughs> give people belonging. But there definitely comes a moment where we need a game, right? Yeah. Because we need energy. We need some sort of a moving out of our possibility zone, you know, and there's yeah. no doubt that if you're living in the world of scarcity, it's very hard yeah. to get out of that. Yeah. You know, you start to say, okay, I've just earned three points. Now I need five points. And soon you're in the same capitalist game within yeah. your um you know within within your open credit as you were before so actually creating the ecology of emotions is one of the major things you're trying to do i think in yeah. in, in that and you know there's um you know sometimes it can get so technical there's not enough enough of the feminine in it you know which is built which is thinking of that as mm. the main issue building this building the emotional world that we can all be part of and I would definitely say that gaming it plays a role. But if it was all about gaming, we'd be in trouble, yeah. you know. And if it was all about scarcity, we'd be in trouble. Chris, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, if I can just quickly interject, it is. I, I liken it to the current system as to playing a game of rugby with a football, or a game of football with a rugby ball. You know, you don't get the outcomes that you're really looking for. Um, and for me, that's the problem. Is we, we, we're playing by a set of rules. We've got a sharing economy, haven't we? But we don't because shareholders don't share. Landlords don't share. Lenders don't share. There's a big issue here. We need a new set of rules and a new instrument, you know? And um, I think mutual credit, it covers... I mean, for, for me, what's needed is the great expression, mutual assurance, Okay. <laughs> What, what, what banks provide is a guarantee. They can, I don't trust you or I don't know you and therefore I need somebody who comes between you and me and that middleman provides trust or essentially guarantees the relationship. And I, I'm absolutely sure that having done 20 years work on this, that there are ways of just basically simple agreements 
risk sharing agreements, cost sharing agreements, surplus sharing agreements, not organizations. We've got enough organizations. We need agreements. And the next. Oh. Oh. Oh, it was really, I was right hanging on that. The, the, next. <laughs> the next. Chris, if you're still there, you'll have to put that in the text box. Um, and I think that, you know, if unless there's another burning question, that might be the moment. Oh, Chris, come back. You're back. You're back. Tell us. And the next. What's Sorry? The next? You, you, you got cut off just as you said the next. <laughs> lost him again. <laughs> I think the universe is playing around with us now. Um, it's a game, Chris, right? Chris, yeah, it's a game, definitely. Uh, Chris, I really invite you to um, yeah, put it into the text box before, it, before the internet kills you again. Um, and in the meantime, uh, Oli, any closing comments? Because I think we should let you go back to your um, child. <laughs> None really. No, I just thank you, everyone. Like it's been all of the things that I've heard back have been really fascinating. And there's, you know, clearly some key people here who are all working on, um, yeah, the same, the same objectives and the same challenges. I feel like we're all coming from the same place and there's a lot of mutual agreement here. So it's really encouraging. And um, yeah, I just uh, would encourage you to all keep pursuing your projects and to, um, yeah, sh share share keep sharing the word and and everything that you're doing like i really liked hearing about what was happening um in the in the islands in the canary islands and you know i think that the more lessons that we can learn and steph's ideas as well about the game like the more that we can share our success stories then the more that we can learn from each other and the more success we're likely to have together so um yeah thank you basically yeah thank you so much